Great. So yes, hello, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to Benjamin Franklin House. Uh, this is the only remaining home of Benjamin Franklin anywhere in the world. Uh, so we are very lucky to have it here in London. Um, this is actually his parlour. So this is where he spent his 16 years um, living and working. This was his office space. And then next door would be his laboratory and also bedroom as well. Mm. Uh, so it's really special to be in this space um, with Daniel uh, today. Um, and of course, the focus of today is Daniel. Um, Daniel Larn is our Fulbright Lecture in Residence uh, for, for today's session. Um, and he's going to present a, a wonderful lecture um, on eco-drama um but um just for everyone at home just so you know um this is being recorded um and um will be available on youtube after the session as well um post captioning is also available for anybody who requires that um and also please um as we're going along submit any questions that you have um because we'll be uh, there'll be about 15 minutes at the end of daniel's lecture um for for him to answer those as well so anything that comes up um feel free to submit and same to everyone in the room if you have any questions save them for the end and then uh, yeah there are those at the end if that sounds okay sounds um good. but great uh but yeah thank you everyone for joining us today um i'll pass you over to daniel thank you very much thank you jessica all right so hello everyone it's wonderful to be with you this evening i'm daniel larlam as jessica said and i'm very grateful for this opportunity to share some of my research with you um the research i've been doing over the past nine months as a Fulbright Scholar hosted by the University of Roehampton. I want to thank the staff and students at the drama program at Roehampton, and I want to thank the US-UK Fulbright Commission, and especially uh, Jessica McIver for shepherding me through the process of posing and preparing for tonight's lecture. I also want to thank the team at Benjamin Franklin House, especially Michael Hall and Jessica Eichel, for their efforts in organizing this event. And I want to thank you for your interest, both you, of you who are here in the room and those who are watching um, from afar virtually. So here we are at Benjamin Franklin House where for 16 years between 1757 and 1775, Benjamin Franklin lived while serving as a diplomat from the American colonies. Franklin was of course many other things besides a diplomat, a delegate and a statesman, an author, scientist, inventor, printer, and publisher. Franklin has also at times been called America's first environmentalist, those who wish to grant him this title typically point toward his efforts to raise awareness about the linkages between industrial and domestic pollution and disease in the young city of Philadelphia. In 1739, Franklin joined a group of Philadelphia citizens petitioning for the removal of tanneries from the city's dock area on Delaware River. These tanneries where raw hides were treated to produce leather dumped animal waste into the local creek and gave off noxious fumes that Franklin viewed as a threat to public health. Also, Franklin owned residences and business properties in the dock area. And so we see, as today, for better or worse, a personal stake or impact close to home is often the motivator that finally provokes us to take concrete action in defense of the natural world. The Philadelphia Assembly heard the complaint against the tanneries and ruled in favor of the petitioners, but then accepted all of the regulatory proposals of the tanners, prompting the tanners to celebrate by parading through town. Franklin then took up the cause in the pages of his Pennsylvania Gazette, but ultimately the bad practices of the tanneries were allowed to continue. So Franklin's opposition to the tanneries was prompted by his concerns for public health, as well as for the value of his business properties and his residences quite understandable motivations for a man of his position and his era. Franklin did not argue for the protection of the Delaware River's waters for the reason that clean water is an intrinsic good for humans as well as other than human life. And he certainly didn't join the cause of the petitioners because he considered the river to be an ensouled being whose pollution would amount to desecration. So does Benjamin Franklin deserve the title of America's first environmentalist? It's a bit of a silly question, I know, but I think not for two reasons. First, because the real blossoming of environmental thought within the colonizing culture, the white culture of North America, came during the 19th century in the time of Thoreau, the trans transcendentalists and John Muir. And the second reason is that long, long before the 19th century, many of the indigenous cultures of North America had a lucid, heartfelt, and profoundly sane understanding of how human beings ought to exist in right relationship with the earth. Just as crucially, these peoples had life ways that enacted this right relationship, cultural practices that gave it a tangible foundation. For example, 
The Haudenosaunee of Northeast North America, also known as the Iroquois Confederacy, follow the seventh generation principle. They view the world of today as borrowed from future generations. The Lakota Sioux believe that animals, trees, rocks, and rivers all have a spirit and that everything in the natural world is connected. The Coast Salish of the Pacific Northeast or Northwest practice environmental stewardship through selective fishing and redistribute wealth within their communities through potlatch sermons. These are just three examples. I'm not trafficking in stereotypes of the noble savage or the ecological Indian to cite the title of one controversial anthropological study. I'm simply saying that the worldviews of certain of these tribal peoples of North America and the practices that formed an integral whole with them ought to be regarded as a high cultural achievement developed over thousands of years and not as something somehow given or granted by virtue of their ind indigeneity. So the title of my lecture tonight is Extin Extinction Rebellion, Ecodrama, and the Myth of Saving the World. In it, I'll be proposing an expanded understanding of ecodrama, one that goes beyond written theatrical texts about environmental concerns. Instead, I'll use the notion of ecodrama to examine political events, especially the tactics of environmental activist groups and the responses to them by the public, media, law enforcement, and government as dramatic scenarios that foreground and delineate the conflicting beliefs and values within our societies about how much of a priority the protection of the natural world ought to be. Ecodramas of this sort also reveal the level of violence that governments and other interests are willing to deploy to impose their priorities and values. The spine of my presentation will be provided by a series of images. I offer these as images to think with and images to feel in response to. My underlying conviction is that the human imagination is mythological and that our thoughts and feelings about issues and controversies of great complexity are often grounded, whether we're aware of it or not, in a few very elemental, very basic stories and images. One final note by way of full disclosure, since the summer of 2019, I've been involved with my local chapter of Extinction Rebellion in Northern California, XRSF Bay, chiefly as one of the coordinators of the chapter's street theater group. XR in the USA is a very different phenomenon from over here in the UK. It's much smaller, it has a much lower public profile, and I could go into more of the differences, but the main thing I have to confess is that I'm sympathetic to XR UK's cause. I hope that they and their allies win a citizens assembly on climate, one of XR's demands, though I am agnostic about what the outcome of such an assembly would actually be. So let's take a look at the It's an engraving made by the Dutch printmaker Crispin van der Paske Elder sometime in the first decade of the 17th century. The title of the piece is Erisichthon Cuts Down the Tree of Ceres. As you can see, it's a highly dramatic image and it takes its theme from a story in Ovid's Metamorphoses about Erisichthon, a prideful king of Thess uh, Thessaly. There he is um, holding an ax in the center of the picture. Uh, um, the Augustan age and his version of the story is itself a retelling of an ancient Greek myth. The name Erisichthon means literally earth terror and can be more loosely and poetically translated as ravager of the earth. Here's another image um, a more ancient image of Erisichthon, um, probably of Erisichthon from a Greek vase. According to Ovid, Erisichthon was, quote, a man scornful of the gods who burnt no incense on their altars. All quotations tonight are from the translation of the Metamorphoses by Anthony S. Klein. Ovid writes, Erisichthon, it is said, once violated the grove of Ceres with an ax and desecrated the ancient woods with iron. Within them stood a great oak, massive with the years, a sacred grove in itself. Strands of wool, wreaths of flowers and votive tablets surrounded it, evidence of prayers granted. Often beneath it, the dryads held their festive dances. Also linking hands in line, they circled its trunk's circumference, its massive girth measuring 15 arm, length, arm lengths round. In Greek mythology, dryads and hamadryads were nymphs associated with trees. The lives of hamadryads were twinned to those of their trees. They were born and died with them. And taking an animist interpretation, one could say that they represented the souls of the trees that they inhabited. Or if you believe in so being, then they're just twins. 
Ceres, the goddess mentioned in the passage I've just read, was the Roman version of the Greek goddess Demeter, goddess of grain, the, of the goddess of, har of the harvest and fertility. So in Ovid's tale, Erisichthon comes to the grove of Ceres. Oh, this is a, another picture of a, of a hamadryad or dryad, a 19th century picture. So in Ovid's tale, Erisichthon comes to the grove of when they hesitate, Erisichthon snatches an axe from one of them and declares, though this tree be itself the goddess, not just what the goddess loves, now its leafy crown will meet the earth. Ovid continues, as he spoke, while he balanced the blade for the slanting stroke, Ceres's oak tree trembled all over and gave a sigh, and at the same time its acorns and its leaves began to whiten, and its long branches grew pale. And when his impious hand made a gash in the trunk, blood poured out of its damaged bark, like the crimson tide from its severed neck when the mighty bull falls in sacrifice before the altar. I'll repeat Erisichthon's words. Though this tree be itself the goddess, not just what the goddess loves, now its leafy crown will meet the earth. Ovid's Erisichthon is scarily self-aware. He explicitly invites those present to take his act metonymically, metonymic, metonymy being the poetic device by which a thing or a concept is referred to by something strongly affiliated with it, often something more concrete or imagistic. For example, a crown stands for the monarchy, the heart for love, the tongue for language, and so on. Metonymy often plays a part in ritual, ceremony, and prayer. So when Erisichthon invites his listeners to take the oak tree as the goddess Ceres herself, his words function liturgically, ceremonially, ceremonially framing his axe blow as the opening action in a ritual of desecration. Back to Ovid. When the tree begins gushing blood, Erisichthon's servants are horrified and one of them tries to stop him from cutting into the tree again. But Erisichthon shouts, here's the prize for your pious thought and cuts off the man's head. And down here you see a depiction of the fallen servant who Erisichthon has, um, has uh, attacked. And there are some other servants who are not willing to intervene but are sort of raising a fuss behind him. As Erisic thumbs his axe at the oak again and again, a dryad's voice cries out from inside it. Ovid writes, but Erisichthon pursued his course of evil, and at last, weakened by innumerable blows and dragged down by ropes, the tree fell, its weight cutting a sway through the wood. After the sacred oak falls, Ceres in revenge orders famine, and here we see a depiction, it's quite small, but famine, uh, an emaciated character in a ravaged or sort of barren landscape, um, Ceres orders Famine to embed herself in, in Erisichthon's belly. Famine flies to Erisichthon's palace and breathes herself into him. The king wakes possessed by an insatiable hunger. Ovid writes, as the devouring flames never refuse more fuel, burn endless timber and look for more, the greater the piles they are given, more voracious themselves by being fed, so Erisichthon, Erisichthon's profane lips accept and demand all food in the same breath. Always by eating, he creates an empty void. Erisichthon's appetite eats up all of his wealth and possessions until finally, quote, when the evil had consumed everything he had and his grave disease needed ever more food, Erisichthon began to tear at his limbs and gnaw them with his teeth, and the unhappy man fed little by little on his own body. That's how Ovid ends the tale. The myth seems at first to furnish us with two main images the image of Erisichthon, arrogant and reckless, swinging an ax at the sacred tree, and the image of Erisichthon, desperate and insatiable, gnawing at his own body. But I suggest that we can view the two images as one and the same, as an image of self-cannibalization, self-devouring, or autophagy, and here's why. For decades, those in the deep ecology movement have been calling for a paradigm shift, away from seeing ourselves as set apart from the natural world and toward viewing ourselves as part of the larger life world. If we human beings are indeed part of Gaia, the living earth system that, sus that sustains itself through its miraculous systemic intelligence, then by devouring the world, by ravaging it with our machines and by covering over the land with our towns and cities, our roads, our factory farms, our fields of monocrops and agricultural plantations, we are in fact devouring ourselves devouring the living body of the earth, which we could see and feel as our own body, or at least as a body that we are intimate with and an extension of. 
Myth is multivalent. It can mean several things at the same time. How does the story of Erisichthon resonate with us today? What associations come? We could say Erisichthon is a personification of greed and hubris, pride. We could say Erisichthon is our extractive economy. But I would suggest that we also need to face that Erisichthon is all of us. We, those who live within this culture, are all Erisichthons. We are all implicated whether we feel particularly identified with the culture or not. The Brazilian indigenous activist and author Ailton Krenak argues that our global economic system relies upon a faulty cosmovision, the image of a world to be consumed, the image of, a world as a, of the world as a birthday cake that has been given to us, the humans, as a sovereign species to devour. Krenak has said, quote, we are living in a logic of the devouring of worlds. Even those who are living in a reality of extreme poverty inside garbage heaps, they also aspire to consuming worlds. He continues, most people have an abstraction about the world and do not understand that the light bulb they turn on is a consumption of the world, that the hyper-processed piece of food that they get from the supermarket shelf is also a devouring of the world. If we accept Krenak's alternative cosmovision, we are all party to the destruction of the sacred oak. Or at the controls of a bulldozer or a logging machine or a drilling rig. One of my colleagues in California, Kenneth Worthy, in his book Invisible Nature, has written about the dissociations, that's his term, not the psychological use of the word, dissociations that disguise the relationships between our actions as consumers and their concrete impacts on other human beings and the natural world. In many cases, the creation of the perceptual horizons association is strategic. For example, it's a common practice when logging companies are clear cutting forests to leave a narrow strip of trees along any adjacent roadways to conceal the disturbing site of acre upon acre of tree stumps where a forest once stood. The American author and environmentalist Wendell Berry has written, most of us are not directly responsible for strip mining and extractive agriculture and other forms of environmental abuse, but we are guilty nevertheless, for we, for we connive in them by our ignorance. We are ignorantly dependent on them. We do not know enough about them. We do not have a particular enough sense of their danger, end quote. We are like the citizens of Thneedville in the 2012 animated adaptation of Dr. Seuss's The Lorax. The inhabitants of Thneedville live in a walled city of brightly colored consumerist delights, unaware of the gray, deforested, lifeless landscape that lies beyond the wall, their perceptual horizon. The image of the wall, a city, calls to mind Milton's vision of the Garden of Eden in Paradise Lost. The walls of um, Milton's Eden keep Adam and Eve safe, but also innocent to what lies beyond. I believe our society has evolved for itself a kind of naive Edenic consciousness. We are innocent enough to believe that we can live only within culture, leaving nature and the impacts of our way of living upon nature beyond the bounds of our knowing. There's a moment in the Lorax movie when the young protagonist rams a bulldozer into the wall surrounding Thneedville and produces a massive breach. The townspeople stare through it, wide-eyed, agog, at the lifeless dystopian landscape beyond. I know it's a cartoon movie, but I think this moment gives us an apt image for the collective rude awakening to the severity of the climate and ecological crisis that's picking up momentum now. It's also an image for the individual psyche when faced with, say, the latest report by the, UN, uh, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. The environmentalist author and facilitator Joanna Macy calls this kind of personal moment of reckoning the thunderclap. It comes when we realize in Macy's words, yes, we can, we can do it now. We can destroy the world. All earth devours. We are all at least potentially defenders of life. We can cho choose to take inspiration from another figure within the Erisicht on it, that of the servant who acts out of a powerful and perhaps deeply traditional moral ethos and stands up to the reckless king, although it costs him his life, he does the right thing. On that theme, let's move to a new series of images. In this painting by the 19th century French artist, Emile Bain, 
we surprised woodcutter being confronted by Aigeros, hamadryad of the black poplar tree. She emerges from a hollow in her tree's trunk, standing between the woodcutter and the tree that is her soul's twin, and holds up her right arm in a gesture that stays the woodcutter's stroke. Here we see a depiction of Amrita Devi, a villager from Kajarli in Rajasthan in the early 18th century. The story goes that in 730, the king of the 1730, the king of the nearby city of Jodhpur was building a fortress and dispatched some of his men to cut down the plentiful Kedri trees around Kajarli village. The villages belong to the Bishnoi sect of Hinduism, which continues today and which was founded on 29 precepts. Two of these precepts are be kind and merciful to all living beings and never cut or fell green trees. So when the king's men arrived to cut down the Kedri trees, um, Devi, one of the women in the village, moved to oppose them by hugging one of the trees, winning her destiny with its fate, and was killed. Her three daughters followed her example and were also killed. This led to a full-scale uprising by the Bishnoi villagers, 363 of whom were massacred before the king relented and withdrew his men. The revolt of the Bishnois was a historical incident but has subsequently been mythologized and is told with reverence to those who visit the village today. One thing this story reveals, the story of the Bishnoi villages, is that we can look at the Erisichthon myth symbolically, but it's also a very literal scenario that has played out, played out countless times around the globe and continues to play out today. The human rights NGO Global Witness released a report in September of last year after gathering data that over 1,700 land and environmental defenders have been killed over the past decade, 2012 to 2022, with a disproportionate number of attacks and killings, 40% targeting indigenous communities. The story of the Bishnoi villages of Rajasthan was a key inspiration for the modern Chitko movement a forest conservation movement in the Indian Himalayas that arose in the 1970s in opposition to logging company practices and the policies of India's forest department. The word Chitko means hug or embrace. The Chitko movement's first major nonviolent direct action came when a woman named Gaura Devi led 27 women to confront loggers arriving at Reni village in Uttarakhand. When they were threatened with guns, the women hugged their trees to prevent them from being felled. I now jump to an image of a non-mythical Hamadryad, Julia Butterfly Hill, an activist with the group Earth First, who from 1997 to 1999 spent over two years living on a six by four foot platform at the top of a thousand year old redwood tree in Humboldt County, California, to prevent the Pacific Lumber Company from cutting it down. The tree and a small buffer zone around it were ultimately spared, though most of the old growth forest around it was felled. Julia Hill spoke afterwards about how she felt she was in communication with the redwood tree. It was literally speaking to her, whom she, uh, the tree whom she named Luna. The environmental activist John Seed has often spoken about how during the 1979 Tarania Creek campaign um, to save a 700 hectare remnant of native rainforest in New South Wales, he heard the trees screaming. Are such things possible within your worldview? Are these testimonies to be taken seriously? Though I personally have had no comparable experiences, I know some people who have, and they've struck me as utterly sane, totally sincere. Taking the perspective of deep ecology once again, if we see Erisichthon with the ax as an image of life devouring life, we can see Amrita Devi hugging the Kedri tree or Julia Butterfly Hill in the branches of her redwood as images of life coming to the rescue of life. I move, now, uh, I move now to my discussion of Extinction Rebellion, founded in 2018 by a small group of environmental organizers who'd come to the conclusion that traditional campaigning and protest around the climate issue weren't working. But there was no way, given the current pace of change, that the governments of the world would make the transition to more sustainable forms of energy production and economy in time to stave off climate breakdown and the civilizational collapse that would inevitably follow. 
the uh, there's an image of an Extinction Rebellion protest disrupting Fashion Week in 2020. And here is the XR logo, a stylized hourglass. Time is running out. XR's co-founders based their strategy on disruptive nonviolent civil disobedience and articulated a set of three demands. One, tell the truth. All institutions must communicate the danger we're in. Two, act now. Every part of society must act now to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2025 and begin protecting and repairing nature immediately. These demands were drawn up in 2018 and that 2025 goal seems impossibly aspirational now, but who knows what would have been possible over the seven years between 2018 and 2025 if the World War II style mobilization that XR was calling for had been launched. The third demand, beyond politics, we demand a culture of participation, fairness, and transparency. The government must create and be led by a citizens' assembly on climate and ecological justice. Only the common sense of ordinary people will help us navigate the challenging decisions ahead. XR's theory of change draws heavily upon the research of the American political scientist, Erica Chenoweth, who has examined hundreds of case studies of past movements for social change and argues that these movements are largely successful when 3.5% or more of a nation's population is actively engaged in nonviolent resistance. As articulated by co-founder, XR co-founder Roger Hallam, XR's goal is to build a movement with enough members willing to commit to nonviolent arrestable action so as to be able to overwhelm the capacity of the police and jails, creating a dilemma for the government, dilemma for the government, and ultimately forcing negotiation. From the spring to the early autumn of 2018, a small group of XR spokespeople traveled the UK, giving a talk titled Heading for Extinction and What to Do About It at village halls and community centers. This time consuming effort intensive local movement building yielded up a core group of highly motivated members for XR's first actions. On Rebellion Day, November 17th, 2018, about 6,000 people affiliated with XR blocked five major bridges over the River Thames in London. This later became known as the Five Bridges Action. Later that month, Extinction Rebellion began deploying a tactic it calls swarming, using short moving roadblocks of about seven minutes each to disrupt rush hour traffic. April 2019 saw the apex of XR's early success. XR groups occupied Oxford, surface, Oxford Circus, Parliament Square. This was the action in which they parked their iconic pink tell the truth boat in the middle of Oxford Circus. XR protesters held each of the sites for several days despite attempts by police to clear them. These, action, these actions lasted for 11 days in total and 1,130 arrests were made. XR tallied some significant wins in 2019. The UK government declared a climate emergency in May 2019, and six select committees in the, in the House of Commons commissioned Climate Assembly UK in June. The Assembly delivered its final report in September 2020. Its, re its recommendations included a tax on frequent flyers, a transition to electric vehicles, greater uh, reliance on uh, local food production, a focus on natural removal, natural removal of carbon from the atmosphere by restoring forests and peatlands rather than carbon capture technologies, and a voluntary change in diet to reduce meat and dairy consumption. However, Climate Assembly UK was deemed inadequate by XR because it was convened under the presupposition that a 2050 net zero target date would be sufficient to stave off the worst effects of climate change because its proceedings were not shared with the general public and crucially because there was no requirement that the government take action on the Assembly's recommendations. During the summer of 2019, chapters of XR sprung up around the world, and in October of that year, XR launched its International Rebellion, two weeks of actions in London and in 60 cities around the globe. By this point, XR was becoming more and more entangled in polarizing media narratives, and a major misstep during the October Rebellion provided fuel for that fire. On October 17th, a small group of XR members targeted rail and underground services at Shadwell, Stratford, and Canning Town stations in London. The goal was to raise awareness about the vulnerability of the tube to flooding. 
XR leadership had been concerned about the targeting of working class commuters, but within, but because of XR's decentralized non-hierarchical structure, the action was allowed to go ahead. At Canning Town Station during the morning rush hour, two male activists climbed onto the roof of a tube train and unfurled a banner reading, reading business as usual equals death. I should warn you that the next few images, which are stills from a cell phone camera, um, are violent ones. Outraged working class commuters dragged them off the train and beat them on the platform. Other commuters and rail staff intervened to protect them. Crucially, as one commuter was climbing toward one of the XR members to pull him down from the train roof, the activist lashed out, kicking the commuter in the upper body in an attempt to drive him back, thereby violating XR's commitment to nonviolence. A few hours later, the footage was all over the news. Some leading figures within XR apologized for the Canning Town action, while others, including the national media team, defended or even praised it. <clears throat> so let's do a quick analysis of this image. We have two men standing on top of the train roof. They've taken the higher ground, which might symbolize a superior moral position. I'm thinking about how this might be read by the commuters on the, uh, on the platform or the people watching the footage at home. The, the, people, the men on the roof are dressed differently from those below them. They wear blazers. They're in their 30s and physically fit. They're white. The crowd is a mix of races. They unfurl a banner proclaiming their message from on high, a message that those below might feel as nonsense or take as an insult. Certainly the implication is that their putting across the message is more important than the commuters getting to work on time. All it takes is one mythic instance to make a reality and for that reality to become fixed in people's minds. Contrast the last image with a simultaneous action by Christian Climate Action at Shadwell Station. An older protester, an 85-year-old retired vicar, kneels with his hand glued to a DLR train. Yes, there are two protesters on top of the train. You can just barely see them there, but they are sitting. They are priests in their 50s uh, and 70s, respectively. The atmosphere is different. The platform is less crowded, but the age and the postures uh, pro are, uh, make the situation crucially different, uh, though, the, though the, the, uh, the protesters did receive verbal abuse. The COVID-19 pandemic brought major challenges for XR and the climate movement more generally. XR suspended in-person activities, momentum stalled, and once a relaunch became possible in August 2021 under the title The Impossible Rebellion, membership, number, membership numbers were much reduced. During the, the Impossible Rebellion, police acted more aggressively and effectively to clear protest sites, and without the numbers they had two years before, XR were forced to keep the police guessing with mobile transient pop-up actions. Some larger scale marches and demonstrations became possible in autumn 2022, but the big news from XR 2.0, as some are calling it, came on the, ver uh, on the 1st of January, 2023, when XR's public relations team announced, we quit. XR would, for the moment, cease disruptive activities that affect the general public and focus again on corporate, and focus instead on corporate, financial, and government targets. This strategic shift enabled XR to bring governments, to bring together an impressive coalition, excuse me, of 200 groups, many of them more conventional NGOs like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth for a festival-like event in Westminster in late April 2023. Uh, XR called the event the big one, and they estimate that around 60,000 people attended over the course of its four, uh, four days. Since the big one, XR has been conducting a stepped up campaign of disruptions at shareholders meetings, while Just Stop Oil, a more radical splinter group of XR, have been doing daily slow marches to disrupt traffic around central London. How do I understand what Extinction Rebellion are doing? For one, they are taking latent conflicts and tensions around the, value, uh, around the issue of climate and the environment within our society, within UK society, and activating them so that they can be recognized and addressed. XR's actions convert these oppositions and tensions into an explicit moral drama. XR co-founder Roger Hallam has written, you have to break the law. This is the essence of the nonviolent method, 
because it creates the social tension and the public drama, which are vital to create change. Another thing that's important to recognize is that Extinction Rebellion are bringing eco-drama, the conflict between earth devouring and earth revering, earth protecting impulses to the centers of power in the industrialized countries, instead of having these dramas play out in places like the Amazon, the Standing Rock Reservation in North America, and the rainforests of the Congo in Indonesia, where the, where the media can elect not to rest its gaze. In ancient Greek, the word teatron, from which our word theater derives, meant the place of seeing. Extinction Rebellion's mass acts of civil disobedience have turned sites like Oxford Circus, Westminster Bridge, and Parliament Square into places of seeing, uh, site-specific performance venues where dramas that our culture has kept in the realm of shadow, a term from Jungian psychology, are brought into the light. XR's founders and spokespeople often place their movement within a lineage going back to the great freedom movements of the 20th century, the suffragettes, the struggle for independence in India, and the civil rights movement in the USA. Interestingly, key figures in all of these movements use the language of drama to convey their objectives. Emmeline Pankhurst, founder of the Women's Social and Political Union, said of the movement for women's suffrage, quote, we must make our protest a dramatic one. We must dra dramatize it by every means in our power. And this is going to be a disturbing image. The next one, the image of a suffragette, which physicalizes very dramatically the power relations between women and male authority in society at the time. Gandhi in his writings referred to his campaigns against racial discrimination in South Africa as a quote, moral drama in which the oppressed confront their oppressors with the power of truth and love. He later described the movement for Indian independence as a quote, drama of sacrifice. Martin Luther King Jr. in his famous letter from Birmingham jail of 1963 wrote, nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth. This is also a violent image of something that happened minutes later on Bloody Sunday uh, in Selma. In the foreground is John Lewis, an organizer who later became a, a US representative. Am I gonna stay there? No, I'm gonna go on. Okay. A social drama of the kind initiated by the suffragettes Gandhi or the civil rights movement forces us to find our place within it or in relation to it. Simply by watching it unfold, we are pulled into some kind of positionality. Do we identify more with the protesters in the road or with the drivers shouting at them or manhandling them? Do we sympathize more with the protester being hauled away by the police or with the officers carrying them? A social drama is a messy, painful, often ugly phenomenon. It opens up a Pandora's box of emotions and attitudes, sympathy and judgment, compassion and contempt, clarity and confusion, belief and suspicion, admiration and revulsion, hope and disappointment. Dramatization means that we will see all of involved at their best and at their worst. We'll see protesters carrying out high risk acts with integrity, humility and poise and protesters hurling abuse and, obscen and obscenities at those that they perceive to be on the other side. We'll see police officers calmly and respectfully de-escalating potential conflict, and we'll see police officers giving a needless shove, a little bit of extra punitive rough handling to someone in the crowd. Polarization is inherent to the dynamic of dramatization. Drama is born out of againstness. It teases latent forness and againstness into active interplay, and it will generate more and more againstness unless there is a philosophical, moral, and tactical commitment to transcendence of, against, uh, of againstness, a commitment, an intention to transcend drama, even in the act of stirring it up. Without this intention, social drama will breed polarization and in a poisonous feedback loop, feedback on itself. The Vietnamese Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh, who worked for peace in his home country and spoke eloquently about our need to wake up to the cry of the earth, wrote of himself and his followers. We are against hatred, greed, and delusion. We are always with the people.
jumping ahead a little bit. As I've already said, social dramas can bring out the worst in us. The conflict between Creon and Antigone is in Sophocles' play exaggerates Creon's rigidity and inflames Antigone's fanatical zeal. But the legacy of figures like Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Thich Nhat Hanh can provide us with guidance and inspiration in cultivating togetherness, even when we are forced to take an, opposition, an oppositional stance. I was part of a protest outside um, Wells Fargo's corporate headquarters in San Francisco in the summer of 2019. A group of activists had locked on blocking the entrance and a line of police officers now stood between them and those of us who were there to provide them with moral support. About half of the police officers wore sunglasses. All of their faces were impassive, almost unreadable. Then Penny Opal Plant, a member of the indigenous led environmental justice group Idle No More said a prayer. She prayed for the earth. She prayed for the brave activists who were locked on and she prayed for the police officers. I remember, vi I remember vividly that she said, may you come home safely to your families every night. The faces of the police officers melted. Some looked close to tears. I thought maybe some of these officers had never been prayed for in that way, at least not in a public context. They were being honored, respected and valued within the miniature community that Penny Opal Plant had just summoned into being. So I have just a few minutes left and the title for my lecture tonight promised a discussion of the myth of saving the world. So I'll close with a few thoughts on that. From the beginning, Extinction Rebellion's messaging slogans and outreach materials have voiced a powerful call to heroism, to use a phrase associated with the work of the comparative mythologist, Joseph Campbell. Take this short passage entitled, Why We Rebel, drafted by the XR UK vision team in collaboration with the author, Jay Griffiths. I'm quoting here. Sometimes it falls upon a generation to be great, said Mandela. History is calling from the future, a hundred years from now, half a hundred years, 10, today, calling the conscience of humanity to act with the fierce urgency of now. This is the time. Wherever we are standing is the place. We have just this one flickering instant to hold the winds of worlds in our hands, to vouchsafe the future. This is what destiny feels like. We have to be greater than we have ever been, dedicated, selfless, self-sacrificial. I believe that such language appeals to something deeper than ego in our psyches, which we could call the archetypal force of the heroic. And when this stirs, we feel a movement of the heart and an energetic surge or thrill running through the body. I believe that these stirrings arise from a deep morality. They represent, as I've come to understand it, an energetic celebration, an elevation or esteeming in the domain of feeling of the heroic values of courage and sacrifice. Extinction Rebellion's call to heroism certainly landed with me. In particular, when I first became involved with XR, I became obsessed in a rather naive way with the fantasy of sitting down on the road to obstruct traffic. I thought this was the most hardcore hero thing that one could possibly do. This image symbolized for me courage, equanimity and sacrifice, but also because of the seated posture, humility and vulnerability. So I got involved with XR SF Bay and for several months spent most of my free time in organizing meetings. When leaving the house, my partner would often say to me, good luck saving the world. She said it once at least. Okay. Um, her words gave me a lift, but she was also trying to keep me humble in a loving, teasing way. And I thank her for it. I did get my chance to block traffic with XRSF Bay in the late summer of 2019, though we weren't actually sitting in the road. We were doing short five minute roadblocks around the civic center area of San Francisco. And wow, what a wake up call. Some drivers thanked us a minority of them, when we approached their windows with leaflets, but others cursed and raged at us. Some slammed on their horns, keeping their hands there on the horns and revved their engines, deafening us. A couple of SUVs inched toward us and into our banners, driving us backwards, then roared away, passing within a foot or two of some members of the group. I actually can't remember feeling any fear that day. I was so adrenalized. 
But in the days afterwards, I felt shaky, out of sorts, wounded by my pr proximity to such aggression. Over time, I learned that I'm not the most temperamentally suited to the most high-risk confrontational heroic assignments. And I've developed tremendous respect for those who are. I also see a humbling and a maturation of the hero impulse in XR's evolution over the past four and a half years. XR's crop of slogans for the impossible rebellion included act now because it's too late and post hope, post doom. That's act now because it's too late and post hope, post doom. Such slogans being slogans might strike us as too glib, too easily proclaimed, but they point in the right direction toward an ideal of unconditional commitment, an unshakable resolve to show up relentlessly day after day in defense of a future for all life, human and other than human, regardless of the latest headlines, the apocalyptic scenarios in one's head or one's mood of the moment. The Zen Buddhist nun's sister true dedication, a student of Thich Nhat Hanh has written, the stark truth is that the planet doesn't need to be saved only once. It needs to be saved countless times for eons to come. Every once in a while, we, we may need a burst of inspiration, a jolt of heroic energy, but on most days, the steadiness is the thing. That's where I'll end. Not with a big bang, I know, but maybe that's in keeping with the themes of the last section or two of this talk. So thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. And uh, I think there's time for Q&A. Uh, yeah, so thank you. That was that was brilliant. I'm sure everyone in the room and virtually will agree with me. Um, that was that was really interesting. First of all, does anyone in the in the room have any questions um, before we pass over to our virtual audience? Um, we have just a couple. Um, okay. The first is, uh, what do you think Benjamin Franklin would think of the current situation? Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm no expert on Benjamin Franklin. I kind of rummaged through Benjamin Franklin's biography a little bit to, um, you know, to, to, to create some kind of context for this, for my talk here today. I don't know, Benjamin Franklin seemed pretty pragmatic. Um, I, I, I read that he was involved in uh, negotiations to create, a, to come up with some kind of peaceful settlement instead of the, you know, the war of, the American War of Independence until like weeks or months before. And uh, so I think, uh, I think Franklin would be very pragmatic about things. Um, I'm suddenly thinking of uh, the eco-philosopher Rupert Reed in the UK, who's a, a very sane, rational, and pragmatic figure um, who occupies a kind of, I don't know, he's, he, he occupies a kind of interesting place where he's able to speak to radical and more moderate parts of the environmentalist movement. And maybe that's where Franklin would be. I would. I would hope that's where he'd be. I mean, if he's if he's still around and if he's sending us any kind of you know communications, I, I hope that, that that's the content of the moment. Yeah, I would hope so. Also, he um, he was very against um, the destruction of personal property in mm -hmm. protests, um, mm -hmm. specifically with the Boston Tea Party. Uh huh. Um, Interesting. He felt that, that was actually putting the cause backwards and um, had offered to sort of try to raise the money to pay back the the East India. Company, um, wow, I had no idea about that. that. So maybe he would, maybe he'd have a real problem with XR and especially a problem with Just Stop Oil, um, who, you know, definitely get the goat of, uh, of, the, of the people that see the immediate impact on commuters or, or property as being the primary thing. I understand why people, why, why people see that at first. What I'm sort of, what I was pointing to in, in, in the lecture is that, you know, you can even see that stopping of commuters or that just smashing of a bank's window as a kind of act against, an act of opposition against a kind of pervasive, invisible kind of environmental injustice. But so I, so, so I, I don't really know. I don't really know where Benjamin Franklin would land. Um, <clears throat> another one is, um, you mentioned the, uh, sorry, I'm not gonna pronounce this correctly, the Vishnoi uh, villagers yeah. uh, were supportive of the protesting family who were killed. Yes. Um, and you also show contemporary images uh, of um, protesters being assaulted during the train uh, protests. Yeah. Um, 
I had seen a slow march uh, on Regent Street on my commute, and I have seen from afar pedestrians and motorists using protesters and yeah. attempting to take banners or move protesters out of the road. My question is, how can XR um, shift public opinion to largely support um, the protests, um, similar to the Bishnoi villagers, um, when it's obviously in everyone's interest, even if rarely inconvenient? I don't think XR can do that. I don't think it's in their power to do that. Um, I think there are many other factors at play um, there are people's sort of ideological stances, but I'd have to say that um, the media environment in this context is um, in, in the UK. Um, you know, there are some very, there are some sources that are more objective. There is a kind of, um, there is a kind of default mode of sort of, um, of, of debate and sort of playing devil's advocate, even on very kind of centrist, uh, seeming uh, channels or programs in the UK that that tends to create a bit of a polarized dynamic. I feel like the interviewer is often voicing, um, you know, really, really sort of extreme oppositions when uh, to to an XR spokesperson or a Just Stop Oil member when that interviewer doesn't necessarily hold those positions. But then you also have you know the the conservative media, the right wing media, papers like the Sun and the Daily Mail. Who are really out? I feel to, you know, poison the uh, the public against any kind of sympathy with XR. And it wasn't always like that. Um, like in the early days, especially the first two big XR protests, there were um, people didn't really know what to make of XR. There was a I I, I found this headline today after XR's second big protest. Um, it was on the BBC News website. It, the headline was Extinction Rebellion. How might ministers win over the protesters? So they were talking then about like winning over the protesters, not the protesters winning over the public. Um, but then over time, you know, the the some of the some of the papers that I've mentioned um, have put out have created this sort of narrative of um, of the eco mob, eco zealots, um, eco fanatics, eco warriors, and there's a, I've watched a lot of these interviews, you know. They pop up in my YouTube feed because you know the algorithm wants me to go down that rabbit hole of um, of polarizing drama. But they pop up there, and I watch them, and I find them really tough to watch, actually. Um, but uh, there's this kind of there's this kind of I, I I've called it to myself theory of the activist mind that the um, hosts of these uh, these more um, uh, right wing shows or the journalists and the right wing papers they seem to have I don't know how cynical or genuine it is but there's this there's this idea that um, uh, uh, that members uh, that climate activists are delusional that they're um, narcissistic that the, it's really about this uh, this kind of show with themselves at the center and um, that they're they're that, that there was this word that was used hair shirtism that they're they they there's this um, sort of perverse asceticism that they are imposing on themselves and they want all of us to um, be part of. And uh, that really this sort of like holier than thou, narcissistic, heroic wannabe syndrome, hero wannabe syndrome is what's driving them. So I think they're turning eco drama into ego drama, you know? And if you think that someone is full of ego and narcissism and grandiosity and they're coming at you from that um, place, it's most likely to arouse your ego in response to it. So I feel like that's one of the reasons why, maybe that's the primary reason why XR don't have the, the, the power to, you know, to, to win over everyone. And I would, just the final thing I would say in response to that question is that I do see a lot of these um, explosions of violence on the street as kind of ventings of a kind of latent violence that our culture, Kind of requires to to sustain itself not all the time maybe somebody is carrying something else but you know you can never really disentangle the these things within like the psychic life or the emotional life you know for a while and still um on uh news program news programs um interviewers are offering often asking a, a, a climate scientist like you know is this particular event caused by climate change well 
I mean, it's kind of an un unanswerable question because it's just a manifestation of the climate and the climate's changing. Likewise, these eruptions on the street, like, is it because the person, you know, just had a fight with someone or is it because they feel massively pressurized uh, because they're on their way to work and they have to be there on time and, they're, and the cost of living is rising and, you know, they don't know how they're going to pay their bills. Um, it's all part of, you know, if we could, you know, to use a metaphor, the, the sort of climate system of that person's psyche. Anything else? If if not, I have I have one more thing that I wanted to say. Is yeah, there, yeah, those will be on questions. So okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said that the Extinction Rebellion was a very different state mm -hmm. to the UK. Can you just quickly tell us the differences? Yeah. Um, well, sort of um, in terms of the demands, um, XR US has added a a fourth demand, which is for a just transition, kind of bringing the idea is to privilege, privilege and bring on board the, the perspectives and, and uh, the needs of frontline communities and uh, communities in the global south. And so that's there as an explicit um, demand. Uh, XR UK has progressively incorporated more and more of that kind of thinking into their platform as well. Um, the big differences are that um, the numbers in the local groups are much smaller um in the u.s oh gosh they're, so, they're very small you know um during the pandemic xr sfa dropped down to basically a handful of core people kind of keeping it going and i do feel like now just in the last few months is is i feel like there's something that's happened in the collective psyche where there's a kind of i mean i think it's where we are in the pandemic there's a kind of resurgence of energy and and, and i feel that the movement uh the numbers in the movement will grow again but another thing, yeah, in XR US, there's also, because they don't have the numbers, they can't do, you know, such um, high risk um, uh, things on such a, such a scale. And also because policing in the US is different and the prospecting of going to jail in the US is very different. Uh, it makes people more um, cautious about taking arrestable action. It's not the same in every state and it's not the same in every city in every state. Like for example, there's a very big difference between being arrested in San Francisco and being arrested in Oakland. Um, so yeah, and you don't get the phenomenon of cop, uh, police officers, I should say respectfully, so accompanying protesters on the slow marches like you do sometimes here. I've noticed in some of the footage in Just Stop, Just Stop Oil over the past, few weeks that they haven't had the police escorts, but often you'll see police walking alongside and sort of calming down, um, uh, calming down the members of the public who get irate. And, uh, and we don't, we, I've never seen that happen in the US. I've never seen those kind of police escorts. The last thing that I wanted to say, do we have like one or two more minutes? Yeah. Okay, the last thing I wanted to say was um, kind of along the lines of, what I've been talking about, like the theme of polarization. Just in the last few days, I saw a really powerful video um, on YouTube, an interview between Esther Perel, the psychologist, and Yuval Noah Harari, the historian who wrote Sapiens and other books, and is speaking out about the risks of AI now. And they, had a, they were having a conversation, a conversation about polarization in relationships and sort of polarization in the collective. And I came away from that, what I took most away from it, from it, which was, um, which was actually coming from mostly what Esther Perel, the psychologist, was saying, um, as something that we all can do to sort of diffuse, de-escalate the the kind of energy of polarization is hold the contradictions. Hold the contradictions. Um, I think that, for example, um, progressives tend to be more identified and positive with the idea of social change and conservatives tend to um, be the ones who are manifesting gratitude for, and even love of the culture as it stands or, or how things were in the past. And I think sometimes, um, sometimes uh, environmentalists can get sort of hooked on a, uh, on a fantasy of, uh, uh, of, a, of a green future that's kind of like inevitable if we make certain decisions, um, a sort of green techno utopia but the fact is that we could also botch the transition. And I think that conservatives are holding that fear. Um, 
And so I would say, you know, on an individual level, if we can, if we can all hold those contraries, like, yes, we have to try to make this transition, but it's also a very risky thing. I think we'll be in a better place. I think that if those, if, if the people who are um, watching from home and seeing protesters in the street and get so incredibly um, irate and outraged, if they could hold just the fact that those people, in addition to whatever, they, whatever else they might think about them, if they could hold the fact that those people are brave, just that, if they're brave and that they might be sincere, along, which is not you know, mutually incompatible with the fact that they're delusional or they're narcissistic or whatever. If you could just acknowledge that they're brave, if one could just acknowledge that they're brave, I think that would be at least a little bit of an opening toward understanding and not to you know, pose as, uh, not to proselytize or moralize or, or, um, or put myself alongside some of the, the, the voices um, that, I've, that I've invoked over the course of the lecture, but if that's, that's, that's something that I'm gonna carry around with me rather than, and I'll, I'll offer it to you as well, the sort of practice of holding the contradictions. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, thank you for joining us today and for sharing your views. That was, um, yeah, that was really, um, uh, really kind of humbling to listen to, I think. Um, thank you, everyone, also for joining us, uh, both in person and virtually. Um, I hope you enjoyed, you enjoyed your time here. And Franklin House. If you did want to come back to the Benjamin Franklin House, we are open Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays for public tours. Um, we also have another great lecture coming up in June, June the 6th. It's a breakfast lecture, so um, it's a great way to start your day. Um, it's, um, we're hosting um, economist Mark Skousen, um, and he is um, coming to present about Benjamin Franklin's link with um, kind of helping him to create the wealth of nations. Um, so we hope that you're able to join us for that as well. Um, June the 6th at 8.30, all the details are online. Um, on our website. Um, so yeah, I'll um, leave you with that. Um, but just another huge round of applause for Dan. Thank you. Thank you.